someone's using a stapler still. Somebody, somebody's popping. <laughs> either that, either that, or they're clipping their toenails. <laughs> And I'm Len, if you want to include me on the open mic. Who is that? Leonard Lond. Leonard, of course, Leonard. To have you down. Doing good. Thank you. OK, um, we have one, one more spot for the open mic. If, if anyone would like to read a, a single poem tonight, speak out now. I'd be interested. OK. OK, Laurie. Thank you, Mark. Who is that Laurie who? Laurie DeRosiers. Oh. Lori, Lori, what? DeRosiers, it's written on my... Oh, I know you. Yes, of course. Hi, Bill. I came to listen to Bill, but I'd love to read a poem. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Hi, Lori. Hi. Lori DeRosiers, of course, I know we're, 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 we're long-time Facebook acquaintances. <laughs> Hi, Larissa. How are you? I'm well, thank you, Laurie. It's thank great you. to talk to you in person. <laughs> nice to finally <laughs> intermeet. Hello. Hello. In, in, as in person as you can get. This is pretty close. Yeah. Hey, Laurie, it's Joni. Hey, hi, everyone. How you doing? That's great. <laughs> Joni, how are you? Oh, I'm hanging in there. Yeah. Just got out of the pool. Oh, life is tough. <laughs> it is. It's, it's rotten. It's terrible. <laughs> Hi, Lori. This is Michael Keith. Hi, Michael. How are you? I see How you're you doing. Friend. Good. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry I missed your Trevena Barba reading. Oh, that's okay. I, yeah, you can't get to all of them. She's having one every day. Well, I had the time wrong. I didn't realize it was at two. I thought it was at seven in the evening. So sorry. Oh, I, I, want, I wanted I to see. I got that mixed up too in the beginning. It's a little confusing. <laughs> Thank you for thinking of me, but you've heard me read. So. <laughs> That's why I wanted to hear you again. Oh, thank you. Now I got to figure out what to read. This. <laughs> all right. Should I go ahead and uh, mute all so to keep out the Zoom bombers and unmute the hosts? Sure. Thank you. Oh, Let's see here. Mute all our participants. Unmute themselves new. Okay, here we go. Now it's just me and Larissa and Mark. Oops, you got it, Larissa? There we go. Can you hear me? Yes, yep. we can. We can. Very good. I'm on mute. Please feel free to commence the operations, Larissa. Mark, I believe you're introducing me. Yes, absolutely. Um, but you always like to say something in the beginning, of don't you? Of course, I would like to. Welcome. Black Lives Matter, wear your mask, and welcome to Lit Bomb. We are your literary relief during this time of postponed reading parties and postponed readings, postponed book parties. We want to bring a little literary life into your life. And, and today we have a great show for you today. We have um, C.A. Conrad, Bill Yarrow, Anna Halverson, and Tara Campbell for you today. So we, we're looking forward to a rocking, um, and we have our open mic is full right now, but you know, we'll see how that goes. Um, and um, okay, Mark, over to you. Thank you, Larissa. Yes, welcome everybody to Lit Bomb, um, our 18th episode, I believe. Um, it has been a long haul, as we all know, already. I'm guessing it's going to be an even longer haul on the other side. Um, so buckle down and read as much good literature as you can, um, especially from Mad Hat Press. <laughs> um, at any rate, um, the way we traditionally do this is uh, each of the founders reads one poem and then we go to the feature section, which tonight, as Larissa has said, features uh, Bill Yarrow, Tara Campbell, C.A. Conrad, and Anna Haberstadt. Um, and now, Larissa. Larissa's new novel um, is Sly Bang. Her first novel was Patient Women. Her poetry collections are Medusa's Country, hashtag special characters, in Paran, uh, the chapbook, A Cure for Suicide, which I highly recommend, from Chavena Press. 
and the ebook Fib Sequence Artist Ebooks. Her poetry albums on the No Net World and Exorcism, for which she won the New Century Best Spoken Word Album Award. Larissa's work has appeared in the anthologies Measure for Measure from Penguin Random House, Words for the Wedding, also from Penguin, Contemporary Russian Poetry from Dolky, and Choice Words Writers on Abortion from Haymarket. Larissa is the original English language translator of the futurist opera Victory Over the Sun by Alexei Krushnyanev, performed at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Garage Museum of Moscow, the Brooklyn Academy of Music and Theaters and universities worldwide. Larissa also edited the anthology 21st Century Russian Poetry, uh, which is an amazing uh, anthology um, from Big Bridge Press and has been a translator for the Eugene A. Nida Institute for Biblical Scholarship of the American Bible Society. Um, Larissa's uh, work and, and contacts can be seen at www.larissashmilo.com. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I'm going to read a poem, um, a Sestina from my, my Mad Hat Poetry Collection, Medusa's Country. It is, um, it is the, the comma, live, not die, live, not die. Now, how shall it continue, bright primate? How shall this be punctuated? An Oxfordian series, cursed, moving ever on, entailing every monkey, all keyboards in existence, black and white, and all of Shakespeare's work, Therein lies a tale. Is my silly hoping life then the parentheses in the mind of a savage loving God or a twitching rapid question in the tick-tock of the void? Comma or coma, which is it to be? Angels, you decide. Faster. My hope today, a ferocious hankering monkey wrestles with Thanatos in my psyche's mud about observed by angels and truly all about you, my demons, who intone Shakespeare's verse like a Polonius behind a curtain, his platitudes punctuated by doubt, growing like a semicolon in my gut, close these parentheses without fortitude or fort and brass, a hamlet dangling on his question. Come. Ask me if I dare, beloved, before I go to ask the question. Would you say, turning me aside as an afterthought in parentheses, that is not what I meant at all? Leaving me a grinning, groping monkey to chase distant mermaids in the sea spray, those soggy singing angels who sing to drowning women like me. I am not brave, not Shakespeare's heroine, and will not declaim mercy for men in a speech punctuated by all wisdom, warm, maternal, eternal. I am rather a rattled, tangled monkey, fur matted, teeth sharp, staring down my death in a showdown punctuated by words, 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 and those in parentheses whisper with epithets of my end. Here I sit periodic, asking the angels, how long a sentence will I have and will I ever write one as good as Shakespeare? To bees and not to bees and they're soon extinct too, begging the question, petitio principi, Assuming the initial point, how should I get to the final? Punctuated by logical fallacies, tautologies, circular, as raw as the tail ass of a monkey, me, to persuade you had we word enough for time. There could be no question, no crime in assuming infinity and basking in eternity like seraphim. Bright angels whose divine lust could blast a trillion beers and years through a million Shakespeare's lines, but our lives are slashed by a ginzo knife through the tail, trapped in parentheses. To the period's point now, signaled by a capital flourish and punctuated with the Oxfordian serial clause, I should have been a pair of claws instead of monkey balls, given infinity when my molecules scatter on some infinite star populated by angels. Might they not reassemble as me, my primate self, and you, a man as fine as Shakespeare's best again? to dance together, coupled, contained in divine parentheses. For the thought of you, whom I love, I trouble the, div the divine to ask this question. My monkey question is not eloquent nor metaphysical as angels. It stands in parentheses, rolls not from the tongues as Shakespeare, but loves you, period, whichever is punctuated in eternity or extinction. 
Thank you very much. It, it is now my pleasure to introduce my, my wonderful co-host, Jonathan Penton. In 1998, Jonathan Penton founded UnlikelyStories.org, which has been running as a continuously updated web magazine since. Unlikely Stories spawned a daughter company, Unlikely Books, which publishes three to five poetry books per year. Jonathan has lent editorial and management assistance to a number of literary and artistic ventures, such as the New Orleans Poetry Festival, Mad Hat Inc., and Big Bridge. He has organized literary performances in Alabama, Arkansas, California, Chihuahua, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, Illinois, Louisiana, Massachusetts, New, Massachusetts, New Mexico, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, Texas, and Washington State and DC. His poetry books are Last Chap, Blood and Salsa, Painting Rust, Prosthetic Gods, and Standards of Sididi and the free eChap backstories, which you can download right now, if you like, at, from Argotist eBooks. Uh, e Please help me welcome Jonathan. Thank you, Larissa. So I'm not very prolific, so what I do most weeks is read a poem that we published on Unlikely Stories uh, in the past week. So this is such a poem. Uh, it's called, Can You Tell Me Where It Went Wrong? And it's by John Sweet, and it's on unlikelystories.org now. Can you tell me where it went wrong? And it's always the end of the war, and it's always the beginning. And she says she's tired of my country right or wrong. Says she's tired of having to choose between fuck and love. Wants it all. Wants to shake off Morrison's ghosts, Cobain's, Rimbaud's, her father's. And not every song on the radio has to mean something, right? Not every day that passes has to feel like one that matters. And we drift as shaky as nervous fire down the streets of this nowhere town. We wait for a better God or a stronger drug because one will fuck you up just as good as the other. And it feels good either way, doesn't it? And she says it feels like the rest of her life will always look better from a distance. So she's forgotten what I was like when I was young, when I was fun. And what I feel like now on any given day is the deep end of a shallow grave. What I dream of is a stranger in the other room, faceless but not voiceless, throat filled with mortal laughter, teeth stained with blood. And when I wake up, there's work, unpaid bills, and the threat of rain, all of the reasons a man might need for turning away. Okay, again, that was by John Sweet. Uh, I'd like to introduce our co-host, Mark. Mark Vincennes is an Anglo-Swiss poet, a fiction writer, translator, editor, published designer, multi-genre artist, and musician. He has published 14 books of poetry, including more recently, Becoming the Sound of Bees, Leaning into the Infinite, The Syndicate of Water and Light, and Here Comes the Night Dust. Vincennes' newest collection, The Little Book of Earthly Desires, and a novella set in ancient China, Three Daos of Dao, or How to Catch a Fortuitous Elephant, are both forthcoming in 2021 from Swight and Dival. An album of music, ambience, and verse, Left Hand Clapping, is also forthcoming from Tree Torn Records. Vincennes is also a prolific translator and has translated from the German, Romanian, and French. He has published 10 books of translations, most recently Unexpected Development by Swiss poet and novelist Klaus Mers, and which was a finalist for the 2016 Cliff Becker Book Prize in translation. His poems have been published in many journals, including The Nations, Plowshares, The Los Angeles Review, World Literature Today, Raritan, and Plume. His work has received fellowship and grants from the Swiss Arts Council, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Witcher Benner Foundation for Poetry. He's the editor and publisher of Mad Hat Press and publisher of New American Writing. He's lived all over the world, from Brazil to China to Iceland to India. He was born in the peak at Hong Kong, but now lives on a farm in rural Western Mass overlooking Herman Melville's Greylock Mountain, where there are more coyotes and bears than people. Mark, will you read us a poem today? I'd love to. This one's called Fallen Cities. In dark, a fight with the plastics, shopping bags, empty orange juice containers, coffee cup lids, and that constant tinkle of kicked up glass. Years of discarded reusables piled up, then churned half digested and spat out, which gives the city its sheen, its acid flux in the sweet vinegar of time. 
a layer of leisure, a capitulation that all will one day be dust, chalk or lime, either way fossilized. Where would be we be without our accomplices? Up ahead, down some forsaken alley, the howling of dogs, the scurry of something, then a leap, half liquid, half shadow, they flow through the city at night. Is this a place or a fragment of one? The stunning faces of those once here, now gone, creeps up on one. Wishing to find dreams alone, to find the fountain at the end of the path, the invented, the completely natural or supernatural. Here, a convenience store open late, no all night, a man frothing at the mouth in the doorway, his head tilted skyward, but no stars, staring deep into forever dark. Lights in windows raising the bar, men invented, the wintering of thought across the threshold of the shop. A single being transposed, and here, something better than light, the gold tooth of a cashier, bright like a Rubik's cube, a diamond at its center, so that when you hit, when hit by a flash of, of night, becomes a symbol of an ever-present Buddha. Will you accompany her home? He asks me, all smiles and packets of free matches. Of course, I say and with your corn dog and coke sipping loudly on a single straw, you say, there are only so many stars. And they all follow the river. The moon appears through the smog, a bloodshot eyeball veiled in ribbons of smoke. Below, a dead bird quivers, coming alive in large insects, their husks glowing against the eyeball. In this moment, you want hope. Genius, this is the moment without a word, and you rear your graceful head. And like in a painting by Renoir, you pixelate almost. What grace. And then your meditation to an honest bloke. Rien, nada, nothing, you say in that smoky way. Nevertheless, the sun is entering the picture and the heartbeats I hear are not my own, but the sound of a pickup truck nearing home. Who will come, you say, on that day you fly away? <clears throat> Thank you. And now we begin our exciting feature section and we begin with Bill Yarrow tonight. Uh, Bill Yarrow is professor of English at uh, Juliet Junior College. He is the author of 12 books of poetry. Most recently, Wake Me When the Narcoleptics Arrive from Cyberwit Books in India. In 2014, Mad Hat published his, his book, The Lice of Christ, twice winner for the Academy of American Poets Prize at Swarthmore College and nominated eight times for a Pushcart Prize Bill's poems and prose works have been widely published in literary journals and anthologies in the US and abroad, including Pank, Contrary, Thrush Poetry, Gargoyle, Diagram, Chiron Review, Rhino, Frigg, Eastern Iowa Review, Poetry International, The Decadent Review, Fulcrum, Home Planet, News Online, and Howl. And of course, Unlikely Stories, uh, Jonathan's Journal. Um, um, Point and Music, a CD of readings of 38 of his poems, was set to music by Boston composer Raymond Farner and came out in 2016. Uh, thank you so much for reading for us, Bill. Oh, thank you, Mark. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Larissa. I love uh, Lip Balm. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. It's a pleasure to read today um, with uh, CA and Tara and uh, Anna. And I'm gonna read uh, eight poems from Wake Me uh, When the Narcoleptics Arrive. This first one is called Origin Story. My father taught me how to solder, and that's when I first started to write. Now, when you hold the soldering iron in your hands and press the trigger, the tip of the gun heats up. Novices uncoil the solder and place it on the hot tip, but that just results in it melting and dripping uselessly into nothingness. What you need to do is place the tip of the iron against the contact to be soldered, and then touch the solder to it. 
Then you'll get a nice B to get switched to lay the wire that you want to connect. I really wanted to form those nice beads in my poems, but I guess as in tennis and with exercise and in conversation, easier does it. So I heated up some nouns and placed some cooler verbs alongside, but my sentences began to deform. And then the melted parts started coagulating. Eventually, I found that verbs needed to be hot, hot, but if I fired them up too much, I wound up exploding my piece. So I learned to be, ter I learned to be careful about the temperature of words. It's all about the adhesion, the tight seal. You want the contact to be secure. If a word or a wire pulls away, the circuit will be broken and the thing won't work. And it has to. I mean, if the thing won't work, then what are you doing? What good is it? My father was a miser about time, but he let me labor under my delusion, think that I was doing the work when it was clear that I was not. None of my contacts held. All the wires I connected pulled away. If you had looked at me from afar, you would have seen a boy sitting on a wooden stool, playing with contacts, littering a counter with blobs of solder. If you had looked more closely, you might have seen a boy learning that the best teacher of anything is failure. Anyway, blistered finger by blistered finger, here I am. This next one is called Jabberwonky. I'm sitting in the shadow of fortuitous buildings the Gita on my mind. I wish I were part of an embroidered parable, such an embroidered parable, but I'm not. The speculative adventure even exists. Not far from me, people are bleeding immoderately. Some may even die. Burials with hundreds in attendance will occur. Trauma is, even now, reshaping neighborhoods and firm futures. Perhaps the blue chip solidity of the past as well. But I am untouched. Vicissitude, I am no longer permitted. I am forbidden the fluctuation of human feeling because variety has been deemed dangerous, a health risk, a threat to my existence. So I remain ensnared in solitude, ensconced in stereo curiosity, mired in stochastic observation. Meanwhile, tree branches leaf from a central trunk like ganglia from the spinal cord like lines of magnetic force from the pole, like astro microwaves far above the clouds. Emanations of me radiate from my physical self only to vaporize in a vexed nexus, absent a necessary web. A frenzy of delicious birds attempts to penetrate a pearl encrusted sky. I am a non-commissioned, fond combatant in a war of worlds. Democracy, crazy, nothing recedes like success. Oh, frabjous day, oh, scabrous day, Kalu, collusion, Calais. Uh, and this one is called, hey, pistolero. I'm complex, you're complex, we're all complex. Who gives a shit? Man's fallen and he can't get up. I consulted Jacques the atheist for advice. He told me to beat it, but I lack the proper stigma, I cried. Once a month, I volunteer at the dressage parlor. On Tuesdays, I play pinochle with the son of the Holy Ghost. Every material loss is a gain for the state. Today is the world's birthday. Gag gifts only. Pilot rewashes his left hand, i.e. confidence abandoning optimism, or one more chance at capsizing fate. I was having lunch with Anna the Ma, who said, this year, we're hoping Thanksgiving will be more purgatory than hell. The trees are wounded. The water warms to their approach. Summer is a cumin seed. I tiptoed into the heart's parlor and moved the switch to off. Can you hear it? That's your insouciant speaking. The bats have returned to East St. Louis. Otherwise, it's all just wax. <clears throat> and this one uh, is called scoundrel. A scoundrel is someone who asserts something to be true that he or she knows to be false. Politicians are certainly scoundrels, as are theorists, 
salespeople, teachers, religious leaders, and financial advisors, but also and foremost, writers. Writers of every stripe and personality. Writers, uniformly liars, are notorious scoundrels. Writers, you say? Those vocational slugs? Those harmless drudges? They are not harmless, far from it. Invidious imaginers, corruptors of mind and soul. They make pudding of our thinking, line our souls with lies. Without writers, we would not be the dupes we are of ideologues, hawkers, priests, and elected rapacious poltroons. Calm down, Plato. Take a Xanax. Have two. This one's called The Death of Bazin. The death of André Bazin in 1958 marked the beginning of the French New Wave in cinema. And so it happens. The literal pain in the theoretical ass recedes and the world steps into the moonlight of the new. Though the bourgeois ghost and clarity's mirror become perforce a little harder to make out, identity dies, but not identification. Pascal's bones keep pumping out blood. His plashy information overflows its banks and floods my fields. The dead are spigots to keep our produce moist. Who are these fiscal neutrinos, you ask? The absentee landlords of art. The recalculators, those who solicit no approbation, those who remand no remorse. And this one, uh, this appeared in uh, Unlikely Stories. This is called, You Can't Get There From Here. You're in Brooklyn, a place of cruelty in your youth, a place of probity in your dotage. You sit on a bench, vacated by Jamaican nannies, under which portly, pizen, <laughs> portly pigeons nuzzle wheat squares discolored with cheese. Around you, kids, insulated from the stink of commerce and contract, by the odor of rude commotion, are high jumping to untenable commands, running toward invisible rings of safety. The sound of a broken bus incites the nervous squirrels. Twin bumblebees alight on a dusty water fountain. The cohesion of the day falls hard into vast contrivance. And uh, a couple more, uh, this one's called Tariff Happy. Be subversive in your chores. Knock at the door of indecency and demand to be let in. Factor in your calculations the weight of longing among the self-assured. Do not fob off. Keep a second set of books for Raphael. Inculcate imprudence. Wash with emotion, then with good soap. Expose those for whom freedom is greed. Scour the future so as to inure it. Keep lists. Change the air in your protocol every time you crave a tattoo. Hands off the secret levers of the world. Watch out for the kids of Narcissus. And I'm gonna finish with this one, which is called, Some of the Dead We Carry in Our Hearts. But some we bury in our spleens or hide under the skin behind our knees, or tuck inside lapsed synapses. And some are nested inside rugged ligaments, and some are pushed into fast capillaries, and some are hidden in the pockets of loose gums never to emerge. Other dead peek out beneath hard scars or from under new scabs, or rustle the downy hair on the backs of our spindly necks, or smile at us from between gray teeth. And still others cavort with our favorite glands, foxtrot the well-trod kidney boulevard, or slow jam the crowded blood canals. Until the day they show themselves outright and convince us that they are not really dead. And then in the presence of a mutably juvenile hope, we realize that the only palatable reality is dream. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Fantastic. Thank you. Next up, we have Tara Campbell. Tara is a writer, teacher, and fiction editor at Barrel House Magazine. Her publication credits include Smoke Long Quarterly, Masters Review, Jellyfish Review, Booth, Strange Horizons, and Escape Pod Artemis Rising. She's the author of a novel, Tree Evolution, a hybrid fiction poetry collection, Circe's Bicycle, a short story collection, Midnight at the Orgamporium, which received the starred review from Publishers Weekly and a new book of poetry and prose from Unlikely Books, just came out called Political AF, a rage collection. Tara is a graduate of the American University and uh, MFA, a Kimball Oak Fellow, and a recipient of multiple, multiple awards from the DC Commission on Arts and Humanities. Thanks so much for being with us, Tara. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you uh, to Jonathan for inviting me to read today. And I'm gesturing at a point in my screen that you all can't see, but thank you. Um, and uh, this is the book, Political AF. It's an advanced copy with a big old stripe around, uh, along the, uh, the cover. But uh, yeah, so we're having a, a launch event this month because it's August and I can say this month finally. Um, so uh, for more information, go to Unlikely Books. And um, I thought I would share uh, four or five poems uh, from the book today. Uh, it is a collection of poetry and prose, so rest assured um, I won't read the whole thing to you because I'll focus on poetry. Um, the first work I would like to read is called In the New Republic. In the New Republic, we will call men sir or baby or master, whichever they prefer at the time. In the New Republic, they'll only broadcast cat videos and cooking shows and Puppy Bowl and The Bachelor, never The Bachelorette. And The Bachelors will put all the women they've ever wanted into a row and choose one of us and choose her and choose her and choose her until they tire of thrusting their rose red stems into her face. In the New Republic, we won't ask for the truth anymore, but they'll tell it to us with a slap on the cheek, with their hands on our throats, with gleaming pistoled fists. They'll say these new truths are self-evident, but we'll know they're not new they are ancient. In the New Republic, sharp objects will not be allowed. So we'll sit together and knit our shrouds with our hands. We'll scrape wool stitches over tender knuckles onto yellow-blue arms and wonder exactly which outrage crazed the glass. Whose blind eye shattered the shield between us and the New Republic? In the new republic, we will have no choice but to knit and whisper steel into each other's spine. Remind each other of the dreams we've dripped into our daughter's ears. In time, they will know how to dig and where our bones lie, how to slip through the dark, and how to use stones to quietly fracture us, sharpen us into the slicing edge of a jagged new age. Don't worry, I don't hate all men. Um, just the ones in that poem. <laughs> uh, so I will continue with The Meadow, and this is a meditation on the nature of evil in the world. Don't worry, the whole book is not this depressing, and it just so happens the poetry is for some reason. Um, but this is called The Meadow. The meadow considers the velvety slick on her skin, sips at its edges, trickles it into her pores. Only a taste this time, she swears, until she falls in love once more with her own wet heft. The meadow umbers herself from the silken pool, plumps herself, besotted 
against the dead, skin to skin, until she hates herself again. Eve shrieked, and the meadow has hated herself ever since, has drawn the stain down deep inside, sworn never to drink again. She tries to make do with the blood of calving, of roadkill, of fallen chicks. But the meadow remembers the hiss of knife through skin, that lavish spill, that crimson burst of Abel. The meadow hums her thirst and hates herself, thinks dynasty and hates herself, murmurs empire, infidel, motherland, and hates herself because she knows. She hums her thirst and mumbles tyranny, whispers homeland and hates herself, trills liberty and waits. Glory, she croons. Hallelujah, she cries and hates herself because she can almost taste it. The meadow sings birthright and hates herself, calls out shall not be infringed and hates herself and sings and sings and sings until she feels that velvety slickness on her skin, drips at its edges, trickles it into her pores. Just one last time, she swears. Uh, I will read a poem that uh, is a little more personal um, and hopefully it'll serve as a, an introduction to me as a person. It's called The Trouble with Pronouns. But that's exactly why my lips and tongue freeze, another unarmed black man dead, and I want to be clear, but my pronouns are a mess because I'm mixed race and mixed up, trying to explain in black and white how we and they might bridge the gap. Why do my lips sometimes lack the confidence? These lips speaking out of a light-skinned, blue-eyed face Lips of a girl who grew up in a mainstream, middle-class, two-parent home in Alaska, attended a multi-ethnic school in hell, I'll spill it now, watched Gilligan's Island and Get Smart, wore hee-haw overalls and played with Donnie and Marie dolls, so how am I even black enough? Because I have no history with collards or church. I don't feel like a caged bird singing. I actually have the bluest eye, and my dreams are not deferred. They are affirmatively actionable. So have I actually earned the right to say we? But how could my tongue insist upon meeting my teeth? This code switching tongue, rolling out the right sounds by choice, by setting, by interlocutor, born in Alaska because that's the only place a black man could get a promotion in the 60s trying to untangle scholarships from reverse racism in my classmates' comments. I did earn them, didn't I? That one drop coursing through my veins, a too uncomfortable thought for certain boyfriends' mothers, spending too many years with rollers in my hair and relaxer in my regimen, smiling at the swaggy black coolness my nephew informs me we share. And how could I not fear for my brother wearing darker skin than mine in a world where lawmen with guns don't hesitate to say they. My lips and tongue freeze and the debate rolls on, all mixed up in black and white. Let's see, for my next poem, I'll read a little visual poem. It's called Cauliflower. And as you can see, it looks like a cauliflower. I'm partial to broccoli though, but um, they both have a starring role in here. So this is called Cauliflower. When cauliflower gets curious, it asks to touch the tighter buds of broccoli's crown. Wonders if they would look as good in white. When cauliflower gets restless, it considers a tattoo, 
a little green band around its stalk, or maybe just a butterfly. Better yet, henna, something exotic but impermanent. Because who wants to be stuck that color forever? And um, I will end. Shout out to the tattoo and bills poem, by the way. <laughs> I noticed that when he read that part. Um, so I always like to end my readings with a little hope or at least a little positivity. Um, so this poem I'm going to end with is called In Contradiction to the Commander's Standards and Wishes. And this was written in reference to, you know, way back, uh, say three years ago, I think it was, uh, when uh, officials at the CDC were advised to avoid certain words to ensure that they would continue to receive funding from the new administration. So I incorporated those seven words and phrases into a poem called In Contradiction to the Commander's Standards and Wishes. I base my poetry on science in contradiction to the Commander's Standards and Wishes. I sing of diverse transgender fetuses, write evidence-based verse in praise of science-based wonders, rhyme vulnerable with beautiful, while capital millionaires line their pockets with non-chlorophyllic green and almost forget to chip the children in their trickle-down amnesia. I base my poetry on science in consideration with community standards and wishes, based on faith, in reason, in empathy, in data, in compassion, in knowledge, in questioning, in resistance. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you, Tyler, that was wonderful. Thank you. Next up, we have C.A. Conrad. <clears throat> C.A.'s latest book, uh, Jupiter Alignment, uh, Somatic Poetry Rituals, is forthcoming from Ignota Books in 2020. Um, the author of nine books of poetry and essays, while standing in line for death from Wave, won the Lombarda Book Award. They also received a 2019 Creative Capital Grant, as well as a Pew Fellowship, the Believer Magazine Book Award, and the Gil Ott Book Award. They regularly teach at Columbia University in New York City and Sandberg Arts, Art Institute in Amsterdam. Uh, please view their books, essays, recordings, and the documentary, The Book of Conrad, from Delinquent Films, online at http bit.ly <laughs> C.A. Conrad. Um, welcome, C.A. Mark, thank you. Tara and Bill, those were wonderful readings. I'm really happy to be here. I, um, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna just read along with you. I'm gonna share the poems. Let me just get it up. Did that work? Can you see it? Oh, good, okay. My best ideas come with an ear resting on his chest, a holding pattern of the dove. Feel our shared thought thick in the path. It is good to take it easy on days when we remember we are going to die. We win everything for remembering we are poets. Poets. Names of water and wind taper until they resemble everything. Eyes closed, face tilted into rain. Here's the voice to never let us close accounts. Some days I can only watch movies old enough every actor is dead. This is not morbid, it is the exquisite transitory chewed upon. Reach down, pull out everything we were told not to touch. Gears of the mountains inside a sleeping bear. Maybe I can make that a little smaller so it fits. Here we go. 
I put my face in a small room called a scuba mask. I have carried my room through larger ones. What did I think I would see when he died? I tried to hold him vibrating in the middle of a poem. Everyone is always explaining being alone and lonely, but the next conversation is how we have no choice but to die. M drew his face the day he was diagnosed HIV positive and kept drawing as his face changed. They were sublime, like Monk's self-portrait with Spanish flu. He called on his deathbed at his parents' home to say his father was in the backyard burning the stack of drawings. I wanted to stop, make him stop. Please don't, he said. It's his last chance to deny me. How can I deny him that? My first meal after his death, a decision to persist without him. Please do not attempt to command the common winds. Language shows where we stand. It can reveal how we care about who is listening and how or if we are listening. We cannot even be sick together, wishing karma meant foes against the wall. Mr. President, there is only one body on the planet whose gender you get to identify. After that, it is none of your fucking business. We had much to leave behind in order to follow the river to the sea. My grandfather said, always remember you come from people who wash after work. Migration can change a family. Some die before the end, others born along the way. I know my poems by their shapes and have felt their edges in my dreams. The side of a poem rubbed against my cheek like a bone comb or a lover's toe. I'm gonna finish with two slightly longer poems. Oh wait, sorry, there's one more of these, I forgot. Never mind. forget that. Here's another one. Sometimes crickets allow us to study their musical instruments from palm of our hand, serenade the mythology crawling under our skin. Codes of spring have changed their request. Please stop holding the cloud of smoke inside the crematorium. Okay, let me try to make this a little smaller so it fits. Can you see that whole on thing on there? We can. Okay, great, thank you. So I'm gonna read two more poems. And again, thank you so much for having me. All of these poems are from a, a book that's coming out next year from Wave Books called Amanda Paradise. Embedded signal to shake the day. Do you have the strength to lose this world? Earlier today, I pushed a daffodil back in its bulb. Don't listen to the impossible, not when they're drowning in snow. Everyone wants to share with you the lines they crossed to get here. All indicators say we have been target practice for the gods long enough. In the downpour, on the highway, we get slow together. For millions of years, the river flowed without bridges, dams, casinos. One day, death will just click into every future. With the right quiet, we can listen to the crackling fire that keeps us 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Yes, my answer when he asked if swallowing semen made him a cannibal. Impaled by sharp points of wonderment. He insisted I should know names of extinct species, as though taxonomy ever meant preservation. Telling someone who they are instead of asking is where extinction gets its start. Another window into the carefully ornamented shadow. You call tails while the double-headed coin flies through the air. 
You say the new prison means good paying jobs for generations. This is where I expect my vomit to land. You start using your therapist as a weapon against your friends. You pay to be told new furniture cannot combat the death of your bedroom. I imagine prison guards not yet born having lunch inside their parents. Study design of the owl's feathers to just study arms race of the night. Thank you. Thank you, CA, that was amazing. Let's, um, let's move on now. Thank you. Oh, thanks, thanks, CA. Really, it was a wonderful reading. Um, very interior. And next up we have Anna Haberstadt. Anna's creative work in English has been published by many, many reviews, including Alabama Literary Review, Alembic, Atlanta Review, Cafe Review, Father Nature, Good Men Project, Hawaii Pacific Review, Howl, and many more. Uh, her her trans translations of her poems have appeared in many Lithuanian journals. Um, her poetry has been published in, in, in the interna in international anthologies, Nash Krim, 70 Matter, Black Holes of Letters, and Exodica. Her poetry in Russian has appeared in the journals Children of Ra, The Poets Journal, Emigranskaya Lira, and many more. And her translations of poetry from the Lithuanian, Russian, and English have been published uh, in many journals as well. Anna's collection of poetry in English, Vilinos Diary, was published in the Mudfish Individual Poet Series uh, from Turtle, Box Turtle Press in the summer of 2014. Uh, in, in fact, I, I remember <clears throat> you had a very nice uh, launch, I think, at your house, um, and I was there. It was Jill's house. Oh, Jill's house, Joe's house. It was, it was a wonderful launch anyway. Um, everyone was sort of lined up in the, in the corridors and in the, in the landing and up the stairs and so on. Um, and then Anna's uh, Green Landscape with the Ashes was published by New Median Arts in 2018. Uh, her poetry collection in Russian Transit was published in 2016 by West Consulting, Moscow. Um, Anna uh, was a finalist in 2013 and 2015 Mudfish Poetry Contests and it, in, Atlanta, in, the, in the Atlanta Review 2015 contest. Anna was a semi-finalist for the Palmanok Poetry Award 2015 and was a winner of the International Merit Award in Poetry in 2016 for the International Poetry Competition in Atlanta Review. Thank you and welcome so much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I was debating what to read, but I will read what comes to you know my. I will read uh, a couple of poems from Green in a Landscape with the Ashes, and probably a couple of new poems. This poem is called Prayer for Greater Efficiency. Uh, I'm Jewish and I think every Jew, even an atheist or agnostic has a personal relationship with God. We have conversations. Prayer for Greater Efficiency. Lithuania, country of 2000 lakes and as many forests with Jewish renames, unmarked for the most part and vandalized so lucky to have been born in this green and pristine storehouse of human bones and smashed in baby skulls, sight unseen and unheard of in Soviet times. As you approach the Western Wall in Jerusalem, your heartbeat turns into a metronome. Minutes and hours of prayers, crumpled notes on lined paper left for the Almighty in the gaps between smooth ancient stones Condensed energy of human despair mixed with hope creates this aura of presence. Elegant in black, Satan got to Litauen first in his Opel Capitan in June of 1941. Hey you there, why are you always late everywhere?
This poem is called Vilnius is very pleasant. Uh, I've been going back to Vilnius uh, after a break of 28 years. I grew up there and I was going to literary seminars beginning with 2012. Vilnius is very pleasant in the summer. Nights are cool here in July and August. Plenty of cafes and beer bars in courtyards of monasteries and under poplars and linden trees on cobblestone streets named after the Catholic orders. Decent local beer, Shvituris, is served here with peas fried in enough bacon to clog all of Schwarzenegger's arteries. The city is a romantic ruin. It has not been aggressively gilded like domes of Orthodox churches in Moscow or painted in bright Disneyland colors. Walls of old buildings with peeled outer layers reveal old inscriptions from the 1930s, say of a kerosene store in Polish or Yiddish. On Zemaitiyos, back then, Strashuna Street, in the old ghetto, time plays tricks or moves backward, like Aramaic or Yiddish letters from right to left. When I pass the courtyard where the American expat poet Carey made his poem, I notice the staircase on which I was attacked by an angry dog when I was around four. I must have remembered the time, it must have remembered the time during the war, as told, me, as told to me by Rahil Postanyan, the director of the Greenhouse Museum. When she was a teen, maybe only 13, Jews used to be rounded up by the Germans and locked in these tunnel-like courtyards, soldiers with shepherds guarding the exit. I look at pots with geraniums and sweet peas in the windows, a fat cat with black stains on white fur basking in the sun on the windowsill. The only things new here are the foreign-made cars parked in front of the old wooden storages. Dying sheets, weigh, drying sheets weighing in light wind. A woman with vodka on her breath is smoking on a staircase. She says to me, who are you looking for here? No one is home and anyway, nothing has changed here in the last 100 years. It's a little poem uh, written as an answer to, uh, in one of the seminars, the leader raised the question, can we still write political poems? Should a poem be political? Is there a place for political poems today? Should a poem contain feelings? Should a poem have content? We have only now begun looking at content in poetry. Should language poetry have language in it? Should poetry be accessible? What is poetry for? And if it is for something or other, is it poetry? Is a poem that has content and feelings modern? Is it cool or is it archaic? Should poetry be a linguistic crossword puzzle? Should it be conceptual or uber conceptual? Is a poem a simulacrum or transubstantiation of the divine? Or is only a lousy poem a simulacrum? And then what should you do? If you are seeking comfort and you are lonely and you need something beautiful or something to touch you or move you, a poem is not a laxative. And if you are sad, take a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Uh, one more poem? Yes, absolutely. It's called, You Can Be In Love With A Man. You can be in love with a man who never makes you come. You can hate a man who makes you come every time. You can be in love with a man who cannot get it up or who loses his erection on the first night with you. You can be in love with a man who is paralyzed. 
You can have perfectly satisfying athletic sex with a guy who bores you to death, especially when he talks to you about his great discoveries in science. You can love everything about a man except sleeping with him. You can have sex that makes you depressed. You can do a charity fuck when you are young. You can spend three hours in bed with a man who just kisses your shoulders and back. You can choose to live with a man whom you know or you think you love, but sex with him feels like rape every time. You can have sex with a dead man. You can have sex with a woman who behaves like a man. You can have sex with a stranger, a rock drama, a teacher, a national preserve ranger. You can imagine fucking your shrink, your best friend's husband, your husband's best friend, or even your rabbi or priest. And yet, the one thing that sticks, that stays with you, is seeing him after a long separation on the opposite side of the white sidewalk passing by, not noticing or making believe he's not seeing you, and you voice freezing and heart stirring as you are saying his name, and then he finally turns around and smiles at you, and the skies smile at you too. Thank you so much, Anna. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Larissa, uh, Mark, organizers. Thank you, C.A. Conrad, for joining me. He's a great friend. They translate his poetry. Thank you, Tara, and uh, wonderful readers. Thank you. And over to you, Larissa. Uh oh. Uh, you st we'll still need to unmute. I think, no? What are you saying? Okay, we're here trying, we go. Sorry, we're trying to, we're trying to unmute Larissa. Okay. Here we, here we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, Glenn, of course you can hear me now. Hello. Anyway, let's give another hand, please, to Bill Yarrow, Tara Campbell, C.A. Conrad, and Anna Halberstadt for a terrific reading today. Another hand, ladies and gentlemen, fabulous readings. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your work with us. That was. That was an extraordinary reading. I appreciate it very much. Before we go on to the open mic, I'd like to make a couple of announcements. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank our tech director, Amanda Roberts, who uh, keeps us safe and also um, uh, does all the wonderful PowerPoints that you see during the, and many other things. Thank you, Amanda, for all you do for us. We appreciate it. Um, August 8th. Come to Lit Bomb to hear Emerging Poets Night. These poets will include Karina Van Berkham, Noah Burton, Lisa Rosinski, and D. Eric Parkinson. Come support the young generation. And now on August 15th, we have the Gaudy Boy Showcase of Asian American Voices. We'll have Lawrence Lacumbre Ipil, Jennifer Sang Yun Park, and Paula Mendoza. Do not miss these wonderful, wonderful, wonderful readings. All right, we can now go on to our open mic. And as promised, we're going to start with Big Mike. Can you unmute this, Mr. Big Hello. Mike? And, and give us I think I'm unmuted. I'm unmuted, right? Okay, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Give us a poem. Who streets? Teen West African delivery riders show off their respective newfangled electric bikes to each other on the path of Union Square Park, each brag about just how fast and responsive their own personal set of wheels is. Plutocrat sits, legs sprawled wide open in flagrant man spread on a bench nearby. Foster Grant's executive sweet white hair, blue linen jacket, white khakis, white canvas, Abercrombie and Fitch slip-ons without socks. Next to his adoring bleach blonde arm candy, who was probably really hot 10 years ago when she was still in her 30s. Hey, hey, 50 bucks. I got 50 bucks here for whichever you guys got the fastest bike. Race each other once around the park. Winner gets 50 bucks. Here, 50 bucks. His bleach blonde arm candy is delighted, shrieks with joy. West Africans are reluctant, tentative at first. Don't seem to believe the plutocrat is serious. But the yuppie fishes a $50 bill from his alligator skin wallet boldly brandishes it in their face. Then finally, slowly, they come around and agree. Hey, if this white guy is willing to put up 50 bucks to the competition, why not? Okay, you guys, all set. One, two, three, go. The West Africans pop wheelies and head down the path at full speed. 
bleached blonde arm candy squeals like a little tween girl at a Taylor Swift concert, and plutocrat flashes one big, bright, white, smug, self-satisfied smile. He is the very definition of white privilege. Whose streets are streets. Thank you. Thank you, Big Mike, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, fantastic, Big Mike. Thanks so, so much. Next. Thank you, sir. Next, we have up Don Krieger. Can we unmute Don, please? Hi, everyone. Thank you. It's an honor to read in this company. And hi, Jeff Wright. I see you. And hi, Lori. Virtual private networks. I only need to show my face at work sometimes. Most of what I do is online. Since the bug though, it's that way for almost everyone. We ping pong every other week, her place or mine, four hours each way in my sealed car at 80, like a transport pod in Musk's Hyperloop. Once we stopped in Breezewood for crackers, the manager checked each of us at the door for a mask and any hint we had come for his head. Just this Friday, my office computer went down. I'm not essential, so I called someone who was to push the reset button. The grandbaby was born on Friday, too. We drove up first thing Saturday watched little Becky while dad helped mom in the hospital, then drove back four hours each way. We're hoping mom and baby come home today and we're waiting two weeks to see if we got the bug or they did. Driving back, South Jersey was empty and dark as a closet. Some fool sat in the blind spot on my bumper for half an hour. We were frightened, and enough is enough. I slowed to get his tag number, not so easy since he slowed too. I turned on the dome light and dialed 911 as we passed him. He bore off on an exit just then. Maybe the cops got him, maybe not. I wonder if he had a pistol and what would have happened had I. Thank you. Thank you, Don Krieger. Thank you for your, thank you for your poem. Um, next up, we have Eric Allen Yankee. Can we please unmute Eric? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. This is a poem for Gregory Curry and Michael McClure, two poets who passed away during the uh, height of the pandemic here, of the lockdown. America never listens. Days pass in line dance of death, fear of taxes and faint whiskey breathing. My body lies or sits as I watch cats speak in tongues. My brain belongs to Hades now, cold, gray, and withered. I count my wheezes and think of them as a stairway to life beyond. The old poets die. Gregory Curry was a young poet who died in the hours just before this all began. The old poets have gone to spit fire from the tips of their gnarled tongues. America never listens to her poets. So at last the words are laid to rest and the shadows give one last hug on this night that Michael whispers I am the maker of my spirit and soul into Alan's waiting ear. Days pass on to become God's dreams, and maybe the poets are providing the narration. I have become still, even as my mind fades in and out of my view. When I wheeze now, it makes me wonder if nature got me too, and what's left here is only dreaming. I laid still for a month and could think of no more words. My lungs have shattered and my words lie down in coffins sweet because in America never listens to her poets. She injects white out into their veins and sings them to sleep. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you. Thank you for your poetry. Um, can we please unmute David Lincoln? David Lincoln? Yeah, where, Is that where? D-Link? Great, great. Uh, can you hear? We can. Um, great. Thank you for having me uh, with you, and thank you all for being uh, so awesome. Uh, this is a piece I pulled out. I'm moving and I found um, called The New Arrival. I met Kali on the subway. She couldn't have been more than 15. Poor enough to wear small white gloves too tight for her tiny hands. She came from South Carolina and hadn't been a month in the city. What do you do? She asked. I said I was waiting waiting for an anonymous signal to cross my path. She smiled friendly, I thought, or at least interested, even though she was staying at her boyfriend's in Borough Park. Where is your ne necklace of skulls, I asked. And she opened her purse indifferently, pulled out a packet of vitamin powders and tapped them into a water bottle. It's crazy, she said, drinking. I don't ever want to go home. I told her, that would not be necessary. No point in adapting oneself to everyone else, is there? Like it or not, you too will experience the climb out of a hole in the ground, a stair riding into the lights, the dark falling at your back, the future left in dirt, and nothing to worry about except the only problem being language, the destroyer. Surrounded by brightly lit beams of steel, I rode the dark hole in the ground, falling back above me, the city raising its head of fury. I imagine the most bitter person I ever met 20 years before they've suffered through. The happiness on their faces unshakable. An excruciating memory like a hair I found on my sleeve. That unshakable too. This hole polished by workmen and yet inside there was nothing I could say. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, David, for stepping up to our mic. Thank you very much. Okay, Laurie de Rossier, please, de Rossier, um, please unmute Laurie. Hi. That's Hello. really, Welcome. I'm more people here than I expected to see that I know. That's lovely to see all of you. Um, I'm going to read uh, a poem from my chapbook, um, uh, Typing with E.E. E. Cummings from Glass Liar. <laughs> um, it's just called Poem After E.E. E. Comes. I will wade out into the water that burned our thighs. I will take your memory in my mouth, leap to the time when, alive again, you ran into the ocean, dash ahead of death, of your young body diving in life strong and sure, showing off for the beach girls. Will I figure out the mystery of losing you? Will we rise in a thousand years or drink the dirt, lend the shine of our teeth to the old wavering moon? Thank you so much, Laurie. Thank you very much. Last but certainly not least, we have Leonard Lund. Leonard, can we please okay. unmute Leonard? There we go. <clears throat> Thank you for having me today. This is the closing section of a sequence I wrote for the uh, 70th anniversary of 1984 for a reading here in the Chicago area. My freshly minted ghost met yours in amber sunlight on the brown field where our bodies became lovers before our souls. I betrayed you, you said, told them every detail of our insurrectionist's affair and blamed you for it all. As if I hadn't done the same, speaking through pain like some untried teenage poet going on about the most common events. I even begged and hoped for you to suffer, but that was not my real burden. Even as our ghosts parted, sunset fading as the snow began, I enacted my betrayal once again. I didn't say that I still love you. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you, Leonard. Thank you to our open micers. And, and once again, please, please let's have a warm round of applause for Bill Yarrow, Tara Campbell, C.A. Conrad, and Anna Harvester. Thank you for a great reading. Thank you, open micers. Thank you so much. Mark, Mark any, 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 any parting words, Mark? Um, the parting words would be bundle yourselves tight in every way of the word um, and live with love. We'll make it. Okay, thank you. Do join us next week for Emerging Poets Night. Support the young generation of upcoming poets and um, Black Lives Matter. Wear your masks and be safe, everybody. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Good night.